When I hear fairy tale brought up in a discussion, there is almost always, without fail, one of two points of view that the discusser is trying to get across. A, fairy tale is a bad anime and I hate it. And B, fairy tale is a bad anime and I love it anyway. The consensus though is, everyone seems to say fairy tale is a bad anime. The fairy tale fans will die for it, the haters will hate indiscriminately, and the people that are semi-neutral towards it will edge on the side of caution and say, oh yeah, it's garbage, so that they're not insulted per se. Being that, if you're looking to nitpick points of fairy tale, you will succeed. As far as YouTube goes, I have yet to see anyone actually really praise fairy tale. I've never seen someone double down on praising fairy tale. The majority of people don't talk about it, and the people that do just absolutely demolish it as much as they can. Looking at you, Joey the Anime Man! I've praised Fairy Tale in the past because there are many things I believe it does very well, and I've gotten YouTubers DM me privately on Twitter saying, Yo, dude, don't give Fairy Tale a platform. Don't actually be a voice of reason defending it. We want it destroyed. It's garbage. I'm obviously not going to tell you who that is because it may be taken poorly, even though I personally found it hilarious but my point stands everyone blasts fairy tale this video is not taking either of the approaches i am not saying fairy tale is a bad anime and i hate it and i'm not saying fairy tale is a bad anime and i love it i'm saying fairy tale is a great anime i love it and this is why it's amazing it has a huge following people cried dozens of times watching it there is something to it whether you like it or not today the ultimate fairy tale defensive analysis video telling you why fairy tale is amazing and no one apparently understands fairy tale now fairy tale is like 330 episodes long so i'm not going to be going through every individual scene saying ah this is secretly why this was awesome even though it looked like an ass pull not only will i not do that but i cannot do that if you want to criticize fairy tale for an overly abundant amount of fan service or perhaps stupid plot armor in certain areas or some annoying arc conclusions all the power to you there is reason to criticize fairy tale very much what it does right though in my personal opinion and in the opinion of many many thousands of fairy tale fans outweighs that to the point that low key it doesn't even matter anymore this is the only really defensive fairy tale video on youtube actually really praising it for not only what i think it does well but for what i think it mastered like no other other anime ever has. So while I can recognize its flaws and can fully accept why someone would dislike the series due to what I consider the superficial nature of the show, at least give this video a chance before shooting your mouth off in the comments why my opinion is absolutely worthless and volatile. If anyone really, really loves this show, then for that individual, Fairy Tale is a masterpiece. And since art is subjective, you cannot take it away from that individual who really fell in love here. Fairy Tale is not my favorite anime of all time but it is definitely one that is extremely close to my heart. There is one theme in fairy tale that carries over throughout everything in the series. This one very important detail that I believe people semi-understand but don't really understand the scope or breadth of it. This is what makes every amazing scene really amazing, and this is what really connects you to the entire series. Yes, some background is required, and this will probably be a very long video. I mean, this is YouTube's masterwork on fairy tale, since for some reason, everyone else is scared to talk about it. The only two videos I found on YouTube semi-praising fairy tale was Evanito saying, I love fairy tale, even though it's terrible, which again, does not help your case here, bro. And the cartoon ciphers who said, Why I'll never stop loving fairy tale and explained it from a personal perspective and Loki that video is actually really beautiful but again playing by the narrative that fairy tale itself is not good it just came at a time of my life where I liked it I will link both of those videos in the description as well as the anime man's absolutely bashing fairy tale for being an attempt at a knockoff of one piece a stance which I hope very much to dispel by the end of this video so now that the slightly overdone prologue to this massive journey we're about to be under taking out of the way we're gonna be breaking this up into several segments being that well it's gonna be long and me babbling without any direct direction will be difficult for all of us so first and foremost we have to talk about the protagonist of fairy tale
Nearly every single shonen story focuses on a central protagonist to carry the story forward. The adventures of said protagonist that us viewers can relate to as we journey alongside them, growing as the protagonist grows, experiencing as the protagonist experiences, and while the protagonist reaches a stage of fruition where they are finally recognized or they fulfill the task that they believe in, finally discovering themselves, us viewers can discover something about ourselves along the way. The shonen protagonist role, in my opinion, even though it sounds awfully generic, is fascinating. It's a character that I feel like is almost impossible to truly get right, and can never really be the favorite character of said series. Not necessarily to everyone, in fact, by popular poll, the protagonist always wins the popularity contests. However, to use this as a simple example, if the protagonist gets 3,000 votes and the second place only gets 2,000 votes, that means the protagonist won by a landslide, but at the same time, the support cast is far more nuanced than the protagonist, and therefore, everyone has a different favorite support member. If you add the total votes of all the support members, they far surpass the votes for the protagonist himself. So, the protagonist needs to take some form of generic role in order to push the story forward. A very nuanced character can never really enrapture the broader audience, or be a character that can actually play off other characters in any given scenario. Genericism is the protagonist protagonist's downside, but it's also the protagonist's greatest strength. I'm not gonna go through my personal hot takes of every shonen protagonist right now, that's kinda not what I'm doing, but I mention that because Natsu is a very nuanced character, and therefore does not fill the role of a protagonist. Your generic shonen protagonist is not someone like Natsu in the slightest. Granted, Natsu has the most important role if you had to pick any individual character from Fairy Teru. I guess Natsu's the most important. I mean, he does take down the big baddies at the end of all the arcs, but at the same time, he is very much not like your average shonen protagonist. When you look at a shonen character that's meant to take the lead role, we never want to polarize our audience. We want everyone to relate to him to some degree. That's why if you look at shonen main characters, almost all of them have generic powers. Asta has anti-magic. He doesn't have some elemental magic. Deku, super strong. Naruto, he uses Rasengan, which is essentially a really powerful melee attack, and Shadow Clones, which is, again, normal type, not some element. They always have well-rounded, non-niche powers, and almost never actually have an element. Natsu uses fire! That is a polarizing element! Maybe people like ice better! Maybe people like lightning better! And the reason why I mention all of this is because Natsu does not have the build of a main character, and that's because Natsu is not the protagonist of Fairy Tail. Lucy is not the protagonist of Fairy Tail either. If you look at other generic protagonist traits, they win the big fights at the end of the arcs, they're somehow related to the big main bad guy at the end or something, and well, for the most part in shonen anime, they're dudes. Neither Natsu nor Lucy fit the bill even slightly for a protagonist, and that's because the protagonist of Fairy Tail is the guild Fairy Tail. I've said this before, and I think that wrapping your head around this point is the single most important thing to understand about the series. You're not following Natsu's journey to find his dad. You're not following Lucy's journey to actually become a wizard she can be proud of herself for. You are following the evolution of this guild fairy tale. The challenges they have to overcome, the inner dynamics of the guild, and you don't have to find yourself as the protagonist individual character finds his identity. You find yourself while the guild fairy tale finds its identity. Now, here's where the knockoff One Piece insults come in. And honestly, while there are certain things that Fairy Tail copies from One Piece, and I mean, Guild Arts is literally knockoff Shanks, and I don't care because Guild Arts is completely badass for different reasons than Shanks, is the Straw Hat Pirates in One Piece are by no means the single protagonist of the series. Luffy is clearly the protagonist of One Piece, and One Piece is amazing for entirely different reasons than Fairy Tail. I'd argue One Piece is better. I like One Piece more. What can I say? But that doesn't at all detract from the greatness of Fairy Tail itself. As a simple difference between the Fairy Tail Guild and the One Piece crew, not to either of their detriment, the One Piece crew only accepts crew members that Luffy wants. Zoro has the role of first mate. Sanji has the role of cook. Nami has the role of navigator. Brooke has the role of musician. Frankie has the role of shipwright. Chopper has the role of doctor. Robin has the role of archaeologist, because that's a thing you need on 
on a ship. Even at the end of the Dress Rosa arc, when other people wanted to join his crew, he didn't let them. He instead made them join his overall fleet, where they could still do whatever the hell they want to do when they're not bound by his flag. The Straw Hat Pirates, as amazing as they are, are invite only. Fairy Tale is not. Anyone with the right ideology can join Fairy Tale. It doesn't matter if you're fulfilling a role, and it doesn't matter if you're powerful in any way or not. The one thing that every Fairy Tale member has in common is their hearts are all in the same place. And if your heart can be at the same place as the Fairy Tale members, well then you, my friend, are a member of Fairy Tale. Unlike every anime protagonist that you can relate to in some shape or form, that you can cry when they cry and that you can laugh when they laugh, Fairy Tale, the guild itself, is more than just something you can relate to. Yes, you join in their laughter and join in their tears, but not just because you relate to someone, because you are part of something. Absolutely no series has accomplished this to this end. I love the One Piece crew. I love Class 1A in My Hero Academia. I love the Black Bulls in Black Clover, but I don't feel like a member of the Straw Hats. I don't feel like a student in Class 1A, and I don't feel like a member of the Black Bulls. I love them for who they are, but I am not one of them. I am a member of Fairy Tale. Now, that may have sounded cringe, and well, I understand that, but we must swim through the thickness of the cringe in order to come to the truth. I apologize, but I have to kind of go all out for this video. I have to make my points clearly because no one else talks about Fairy Tale in a positive light. Remember this well because we will be coming back to this point. We will be coming back to the ideology that you are a member of Fairy Tale and that Fairy Tale is the protagonist of Fairy Tale. Your guildmates. Fairy Tale is a bunch of wackos. It's something I love to see in anime. It's something that always brightens my day. The Straw Hats are all weird in their own way, and the Black Bulls are all wackos in their own right. It's something that's always a pleasure to see, because as a self-proclaimed psychotic mad lad, I kind of sort of feel at home a little. Of course, the ideal of feeling at home fits so much better with a guild like Fairy Tale, where you technically are a member of the guild, according to the meta-writing of Fairy Tale. But again, stow that away in the back of your mind. We will come back to it on a later moment. For now, let's talk about why the psycho wackos in the guild are so amazing. So, every character has their own really wacky interactions with every other. We have the manly elfman. We have gun dude and gun whammon who, come on, just hook up already. Spoilers, they hook up. You have Natsu and Grey always neck at neck, and you have both of them absolutely terrified of Urza, the first badass shonen whammon. That's right, I said it. Suck it, Sakura fans. No, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to insult uh, an entire non-existent fan base. There are no Sakura fans. Ha, take that, Sakura fans. Of course, there are more issues in the guild that we can't talk about, where Loxus and the Thunder Legion are gallivanting around somewhere, as well as Mystigan being a very interesting, very badass individual. And I will talk about them in a future time again. This video is not gonna be covering everything, but I'm gonna be talking about a lot. So even though the character interactions in the guild are something you pick up relatively quickly, Quickly. Everyone is different. You can't be like, oh, okay, I get the cardboard cutout character persona, so I kind of understand everyone else. That is very much not the case. The level of quirkiness depends on the level of main-ish character of the different guild members of Fairy Tale. I feel like the early introduction of the guild did a fantastic job elaborating how every single character is entirely different, yet somehow has some really weird sync with one another. You have Grey, who always gets naked for no reason. You have Kana, who's always wearing her underwear while drunk. And you have Mira Jane, who's, fun fact, literal Satan. And she's adorable. Everyone's immediately quirky in their own way, and no one even tries to hide any of it. They poke fun at each other, but no one actually gets offended by each other's insults because they're also part of this weird, wacky, quirky family. As are you. Natsu and Grey are always fighting, so of course Master Makarov always sends them on missions together. Duh! That's the absolute logical thing to do. So many of them join the guild as orphans, Makarov becomes the de facto dad as well as the master of the guild. They're not just his metaphorical children, they become his actual children. And like any good dad, when his two sons don't get along, is pair them up together on life and death missions in order to have bro bonding time. The absolute mad lad. Slowly but surely, you begin to learn the different quirks of this 
this very seemingly dysfunctional yet somehow still functional family where Loki's trying to pick up chicks, but everyone already knows Loki, so he ain't falling for it. And you have someone like Mystigan, whenever he wants to accept a mission from the guild hall, he'll cast a spell on the guild to put every guild member to sleep so they don't bother him while he walks in, takes the mission request, and walks out. You have to learn to get used to the nutso dynamics that don't make sense and that shouldn't work as well as they do because you're not just following the guild around. You are also an individual quirky member of this guild that can get hyped when the guild kicks butt and can get sad when the guild gets its butt kicked. I emphasize the quirkiness of every individual because one big fatal issue with society nowadays is that everyone wears a mask. Especially with social media, so many people pretend they are people they're not. It's easy to do and, you know, Sometimes it's just easier, at least so it seems. A common cause of low self-esteem, which of course leads to depression, is the idea of someone who can't look squarely at themselves, but have to make believe they're someone they're not, stuffing their true self deeper and deeper inside until someone begins to feel like an empty shell. I feel like a lot of YouTubers go through that, and I've done a lot of research on this subject because of my own personal experiences. But even though it's hard in such a judgmental world, you gotta be who you are. The mask and persona a thing does not work. It may be a bandage to some very transient problem. It'll make you look cool for a bit, maybe make you fit in more with the people you want to fit in with, but it's not you. Fairy Tale emphasizes very, very much that every single guild member knows who they are. An extremely common trope in Shonen is the find yourself trope. It's a trope I very much enjoy and I feel like it can bond you to a character as well as really develop certain characters. I feel like Todoroki did a great job of that in My Hero Academia, as well as Nami doing a great job of that in One Piece, among many, many other characters. As I've mentioned, it's a common trope. Fairy Tale is a guild with characters that flood the entire spectrum of anime trope. The background characters are literally just trope characters in order to fill the shoes of another fairy tale member. I'm not saying every fairy tale character is written so brilliantly. Oh, the infinite philosophy behind Max, the sand guy. But while the find yourself trope is present in a character like Jalal and the other members of the crime sorcier guild, it does not exist in fairy tale. Every character in fairy tale has succumbed to their quirky nature. They fully embody who they are. They wear their ideals on their forehead. Even Mystigan, the guy who wears a mask to cover his face and never talks to other members of fairy tale he puts them to sleep before walking into the hall to accept a request that guy never betrays his ideology. It's the same quirky ideology through a different lens of every fairy tale member. In the Phantom Lord arc, I will remember this scene forever. It's one of my favorite moments in fairy tale. While the guild was battling a rival guild that had far more manpower and, a, you know, this really massive cannon, the fairy tale guild was in shambles when they finally won. And of course, different members of the guild were like, oh, Mystigan, that butt face, he didn't even show up to help us. We were nearly wiped off the map. But come to think of it, Phantom Lord had 50 other strongholds that they didn't even incorporate into their fighting force against us. Ha! Phantom Lord so stupid, taking us so lightly. And then the next scene, you see Mystigan in a forest with flags. One flag for each of those 50 fortresses draped over trees throughout the entire forest. Mystigan! The Mad Lad, who's very busy by the way, wiped out 50 strongholds for the sake of his guild. He didn't take an ounce of credit for it because that's not who he is. He's the guy who cares for his guild as much as any other member of Fairy Tale. Yeah, he has many other reasons for hiding his identity from the other members. Yes, that's all explained. But that moment encapsulates what it really means to be a member of Fairy Tale. Every single member is quirky in their own wacky way. They poke fun at each other, they annoy each other, and they all know each other extremely well. They are a ridiculously functional, dysfunctional family where each person knows exactly who they are. They are not hiding behind masks. They are not cowering behind their true ideals while they just go through the motions of making friends with the other members. Everyone knows exactly who they are and everyone harbors the same love for the guild as everyone else. So you, a member of Fairy Tale, at least while you're watching, you are absolutely free. The guild is called Fairy Tale, not of course spelled like fairy tales. It's not like a tale of fairies, the story of fairies, no. It started because the first guild master said, huh, if fairies exist, I wonder if they have tails. And because of that question asked about a creature that might not even exist, a dream upon a dream, the fairy tale guild was created, where everyone can be themselves and dream freely.
feeling. That is the power of the Fairy Tale Guild. That is the beauty of the guild members of Fairy Tale. I'm not going into individual character analyses. That's not what I'm doing here. But you, as a member of Fairy Tale, are also free to drink. Are also free of your mask because you're accepted for who you are. As long as you can accept who you are. It's a ridiculously powerful ideology that is always overlooked. So now, obviously there needs to be confrontation. The ship cannot sail smoothly or else you don't really have a story. If you look at a character as a knife, and in order to really hone the character's character, you need to sharpen the knife. The knife needs to be sharpened against another knife to get rid of the nicks and to hone it further. The next segment we will be talking about is the antagonists of Fairy Tale. Almost every good villain in Shonen has one very crucial thing it needs to get across, and that is a counter ideology of some form to the protagonist. It has to be meaningful that he exists, and meaningful that he's defeated, and in order for it to be really scary, it has to somehow threaten what the protagonist holds dear, be it ideals or their friends. Look at the two enemies to Luffy. Luffy is a moral pirate. Blackbeard is an absolute anarchist, Whereas Akainu is absolute authoritarianism. Akainu is anti the freedom part of One Piece, and Blackbeard is against the moral part. If you look at someone like Pain, he has a very different ideology in how to approach peace. Stain has a different ideology of what it means to be a hero. Shigaraki is an embodiment of chaos as opposed to Deku slash All Might, an embodiment of order, and so on and so forth. These guys are good villains. Fairy Tale has, again, a very different approach to all this. Because it does not have have a protagonist, have I stressed this point enough? Aside from the fairy tale guild itself, every good villain in fairy tale needs to have some sort of thematic purpose to counteract the guild's protagonist ship, not the individual, like every other shonen villain needs to do. Yes, Zeref has ties to Natsu, just like Pain has ties to Naruto. Big difference is, I barely give a crap about Zeref's ties to Natsu, whereas Pain is such a dynamic opposing force to Naruto, I absolutely love him. Now, I'm not saying this to harp on Zeref, because <laughs> Natsu ain't the protagonist, whereas Naruto is. Wow, it's almost like it fits perfectly or something. Zeref's buildup is as follows. He is a good dude. He is a character that very much knows who he is and what his purpose is and what he's doing. He's a very gifted mage, and unfortunately, he loses the most dear person in the world to him. He loses his brother. He then changes his entire life's work. He does everything he can as this tremendously, wonderfully gifted wizard now dedicates his life to try and bring his brother back to life. He dabbles in all of the dark arts and all of the most forbidden of magic in order to do this tremendous task, and ultimately, he sort of succeeds. He ends up trapping himself in a ridiculous curse. A curse of contradiction. The contradiction being, the more he cares about something, the more that thing will die. Zaref is someone who dedicated his life to bring his brother back to life. He is someone who cherishes the idea of life. He's someone who is a very caring individual. He thinks of certain individuals like his family. He loves nature and all the things around him. And all of a sudden, that becomes his greatest burden. No matter how much he loves and no matter how good hearted of a person he is, the people around him all die. Whoever he cares about in his proximity dies. If he gets really worked up, all the trees around him wither. All the animal life ceases to live around him. Birds fall out of the air. Villages he approaches suffer. The curse of contradiction is absolutely brutal. It is something I've never really seen in an anime villain to build him up. The only way he can stop killing those around him is if he stops caring for those around him. So he forces himself to snuff out every bit of of empathy in order for the curse to not take hold of everything he holds dear. But uh, once he snuffs out empathy, there is no longer anything he holds dear. <sighs> not to mention the fact that he only got this curse of contradiction because he managed to somehow cheat death. He managed to use this forbidden magic to surpass death in order to bring his brother back. So now that he's surpassed death, he is forced to wander for eternity, immortal, as the most terrifying arc wizard of all time. The legendary black wizard Zeref, who descended from the most loving and passionate individual to the most terrifying, and he had no choice in the matter. I absolutely love Zeref's buildup. I feel like almost no character has been done justice to this extent in creating a character to empathize with, as well as a perfect foil to the protagonist of Fairy Tale. What? Because of his ties with Natsu? No, Natsu's not the 
protagonist because of his ties with fairy tale now before we even get into his physical ties let's quickly and briefly sum up what i said put into a slightly different light his core personality traits were caring for his family willing to give his life for his family being an empathetic goodwill person who despite the fact that people despised him for looking so deeply into magic to revive the dead he did not care what people thought of him he did not wear a mask he did what he believed was right and he is the core accentuated personality that you find in fairy tale he's an exact member of fairy tale everything about him fits so perfectly with the thematic construct of every member of our guild and due to forces out of his control it all gets utterly stripped away from him it is the most tragic progression of his character as a perfect foil to the protagonist the guild of fairy tale he's not an ideological adversary because it's not the ideology of fairy tale that makes the show go it's not a about the justice of the heroes in My Hero Academia or the adventures of the Straw Hats of One Piece. It's about how much we care about the members of our family in the Guild of Fairy Tale. So as an opposing force, we don't need a counter ideology. We need a like-minded character that resulted in tragedy. That is the buildup of Zareph, but not only that. If you look at most of the villains in Fairy Tale, they have a very similar thematic purpose, even though in actuality, they are all very, very different. If you look at the Mage August, he is someone who became who he was because of the lack of care that his family gave him. His fight against Gildarts was absolutely amazing because Gildarts was putting his life on his line for his daughter as a perfect foil to August who cannot understand the bond between parent and child. You have someone like Irene who sacrificed absolutely everything for her child. She sacrificed her humanity, her dignity. She suffered tremendously for 400 years only for the sake of her family until eventually she snapped. So of course she fights her her own daughter, Urza, who before the fight starts says to her mother, who she finally met after a long time searching, thank you so much for abandoning me. Because if my mother wouldn't have abandoned me, I would have never found my real family. If you look at someone like Hades from the Tenro Island Art, leader of the Grimoire Heart Guild, he is the former second guild master of fairy tale who took a turn for the worse. So many of the villains in the Tower of Heaven arc, including Jalal himself, were part of the same slave camp that Urza was brought up in. They all shared the same familial ties. It's all about that family. It's all a perfect counter to the protagonist of fairy tale. A lot of people hate on the power of friendship, and honestly, I do too to a large extent, so no blame here. But the difference is between power of friendship in fairy tale and other plot armor in different series, power of friendship is the exact thematic counter to the villain that they are overpowering at any given time. Yes, the power scaling makes absolutely no sense. When Urza, who's completely immobilized with one arm that isn't broken and she shoots herself up, shatters a meteor, and on the way down defeats this adversary that's renowned as one of the most powerful witches of all time. Power scaling wise, total trash. Thematically, absolutely beautiful. But to head back to Zaref a little bit, because he's my second favorite antagonist in the series, and you'll soon see who my favorite is. Zaref then actually did manage to find someone he loved. He found Mavis, someone else who had this curse of contradiction. The people around her started to get ill and die as well, so she banished herself to some faraway forest. She eventually meets Zareph, and they eventually fall in love. Both immortal, so even though they begin to care for one another, they can't kill each other. It's actually a finale for Zareph's centuries of suffering. He found someone he could love without repercussions. So when they finally hug and kiss, and Zareph finally cries, caring for this other individual with his whole heart once again, finally realizing that his family can exist, he can have a bond with one another. The life within him is not completely snuffed out by this faded curse. His curse of contradiction overpowers hers, and he kills her. That is the last straw. A finale of Zareph's entire character arc waltzing off into the sunset with Mavis is more than fitting. So even though a lot of hate is targeted at the fairy tale villains, none possessing some overly complicated ideology, and not usually being dealt with in overly creative ways that completely make sense within the narrative. Yes, it's annoying! Look, Natsu ate ether Nano, so now he's stronger than Jalal, but aw, oh, his Ether Nano wears off, so he's back to where he started. I understand why that could frustrate some people, but if you actually look at the story for what it's trying to say, as opposed to the more superficial aspects of the fight scenes, which by the way do matter, Fairy Tale is still really great. Fairy Tale actually accomplishes its thematic storyline in almost every single arc perfectly. So now forgive me before I talk about my favorite antagonist in Fairy Tale, and I will get to him, I 
promise he's amazing. I love him. And you will too, I guarantee it. Something that pairs off very importantly with a good villain are good fight scenes. Now, I am a big fan of fight scenes. I would say I'm a fight scene enthusiast, as most of us are. Most of us probably started watching anime for the fight scenes, and, well, Fairy Tail doesn't exactly do a good job with a lot of it. I try to look past a more superficial choreography, even though choreography is very important, and Fairy Tail doesn't exactly score high points for that one. Every good fight scene tells a story in the way the fight starts, in the way the tide of the battle sways, and in the way the fight ends. It's all a miniature story within the greater story of the arc of the greater story of the series. You find it's told this way in every single good fight scene in anime. I recently uploaded my 800,000 subscriber special, and I talked about my 10 favorite fights in anime. Funnily enough, none of them are actually just really cool animation and choreography. There's always some sort of deeper thing going on there. Luffy versus Katakuri isn't a battle of strength, it's a battle of ideals. Esterosa versus Escanor isn't a battle of strength. It's a battle of their opposing psychologies on how each of them suffers in their own way. Lee versus Gara is not amazing because of the cool choreography as much as it's amazing because of the overall theme of hard work versus natural talent. So now, as a kind of subcategory of villains, we need to have good fight scenes. Now let's talk about the fights of Fairy Tail. As I've mentioned, every fight, at least with the good ones, needs to be a little encapsulated story of the overarching themes of whatever the hell is going on. So if you look at the basic outline of fairy tale fights, well, almost everyone is disappointed and they are shat on on YouTube constantly. Granted, the choreography is not the greatest ever. To be fair, the choreography in One Piece isn't that fantastic either. But no one complains about those fights. The choreography in Dragon Ball is not great, but everyone loves Dragon Ball fights. Scenes. There's another problem with fairy tale. The issue, or at least the so-called issue slash problem, is the lack of impact in the fight's finale. As I've mentioned, when building up villains in fairy tale, fairy tale does a tremendously good job. Jalal being part of the slave camp, Zeref having the curse of contradiction, whatever the hell it may be, villain buildup is great. But it's really hard to solidify a villain as a fantastic villain if the villain takedown is not. This is a flaw that many people like to point fingers at fairy tale for because a a lot of the fights end in the same slightly underwhelming fashion. Natsu eats Ether Nano to defeat Jalal, loses Ether Nano powers for later. Natsu eats Golden Fire Thingo to fight against Zero, loses Golden Fire Power Thingies for later. Natsu eats Loxus's Lightning against Hades, isn't nearly as awesome with that lightning power later. It's always some generic power up that doesn't even fully flesh into the story, that usually doesn't even impact the greater story past that. It's not hard work on Natsu's part that let him pull through at the very last second. It's at the very best. The power of friendship. Yeah, I said it. But just like when I was talking about the fairy tale members segment, the power of friendship fits in the theme of fairy tale far better than hacks plot boosts to protect your friends do in most other series. It's not Naruto is fighting to become the greatest Hokage and also he happens to have friends. The core theme of fairy tale is this family. So while the theme is nice to stress that the main character is winning with the power of friendship, well, it doesn't exactly make the fight scene all that riveting. I personally, and I'm gonna be stretching the envelope on the definition of fight scenes here, think the fight scenes in Fairy Tale are actually pretty great as well. Now, not at all in the normal definition of what a fight scene is, though, but honestly, that doesn't even really matter all that much. I will elaborate, so please hang on for a second. In a series like Naruto, Dragon Ball, My Hero Academia, or Black Clover, the goal is to become the strongest at something. The greatest hero! The wizard! Desert King, the Hokage, Goku just wanting to beat his opponent for the sake of winning. Whatever it is, the idea is becoming stronger. So since that is the theme at work, pushing the protagonist forward, they have to overpower their opponents through strength. Strength has to be that breaking point that allows the main characters to push forward and head into their next challenge with their heads held high. Because of this, Naruto overpowering Pain, Asta managing to beat Veto with help from his guild, Deku and his squad managing to take down Stain, or Goku literally overpowering everyone ever. That's something that needs to happen in order for the series to progress. So, the tale of any individual fight scene is growth oriented on a power basis. Let's say Goku, before fighting his generic opponent, for the sake of argument, has a power level of just a wee bit over 9,000! 
house. Been pretty crazy, I know. And his opponent, well, his opponent has a power level of a hundred thousand. So the enemy is like way stronger than Goku. Now at their first squabble in the beginning of the arc, let's say he slaps the craps out of Goku. Goku has like no chance against him, but because he's a resilient Saiyan warrior that pushes forward, he manages to unlock a new form. And by the end of the arc, bamo, power level of a trillion. This may be slight hyperbole on my part, but it's not that far off, okay? Being that the power growth is the overall story, the tail of any individual fight needs to take that turn. Now, if Goku's power was completely retconned after the fight, like Natsu's Ether Nano wore off, Goku forgot how to go into Super Saiyan. He can't do that ever again. That would be a slap in the face to everyone who actually fought through the entire arc where Goku managed to get to that point. The narrative of that arc cannot be counteracted, and the flow of the story fits nicely. Fairy Tail has a very different perspective of all of that. Natsu, well, he doesn't have some massive goal of becoming the strongest ever. In fact, he's not even the protagonist of the series. If the protagonist is the fairy tale guild, and it's that guild that's evolving every individual member, as well as integrating them with one another, and with us, the viewer, the proper evolution of any fight scene needs to be from that standpoint as well. And I will give you several examples of this. I love making fun of Natsu eating Ether Nano to beat Jalal in the Tower of Heaven arc. I love it because it's an exact quintessential point that everyone likes to poke fun at Fairy Tale 4. But the overall message of that arc is that overcoming of your past, that real bond with your family, and picturing what you really care about as supposed to what left you behind. I'm not gonna spoil every detail of that arc, because this video would be even longer than it actually is, but Urza is left absolutely shattered at the end of the Tower of Heaven arc. It's more than just she saw the ghosts of her past. She was literally dragged down to the depths of her mental hell from before she joined Fairy Tale. This arc is where she was living in two completely diametrically opposed universes. The world of Fairy Tale that she became so entrenched in, it literally became her actual family and the family she left behind. Well, not her real one, but the ones she grew up with in this slave camp that she really cared about. This arc tore at Urza's psyche to a tremendous degree, and it was up to Natsu, this guy who's even weaker than Urza, this guy that's essentially the little brother of Queen of the Fairies to Tanya, Urza Scarlet, stands up to the playing field, and even though he should stand no chance, he actually manages to defeat Jalal, the ultimate adversary, poisoning Urza's mind at this given point in time. The moment of Natsu stepping forward to fight Jalal, even though by all logic and by all power scaling feats, Natsu should have no chance, he manages to find a loophole in the system, eat the ether nano garbage in order for that one period of time, actually manage to overpower Jalal, and actually manage to free Urza from the shackles bonding her to her past, saying that no, your actual family will put their life on the line for you in an instant. The objective of that battle is not Natsu growing to the next level of power and not Natsu fighting some counter ideology. This is a hurdle for Urza to overcome, that her family steps in and helps her out to do it. That is why the fight scenes in Fairy Tale are actually great. The emotional impact that a lot of them hold is out of the league of the majority of other anime fights. And I'll give you another example from this current arc that just ended. Invel is this really powerful ice wizard dude. In fact, he's so strong, no one has a chance against him. Until he's defeated by the power of friendship, of course. He's up against Grey and Juvia, and he has this ridiculously powerful ice necklace thingamahoozamabab that can take over the mind of his opponent. Yeah, pretty broken. So he kind of wants Grey to join him, and Grey says, uh, no fam, this ain't it, chief. So he decides, okay, so we'll make your demon powers take you over. He puts these mind control necklace thingos on Juvia and on Grey, and commands them both to kill each other. His plan is, Grey is way stronger than Juvia, he'll kill her, he'll fall into a really sorrowful state, his demon powers will take him over, he'll join the bad guys. Great plan, Invel, extremely cool. And in an instant, without any time to really think about it, both Grey and Juvia come to the same conclusion and attempt to kill themselves. It's the only choice to hurt a precious member of the family that you care so much about. Killing yourself is the easy way out. It's the only only option. Fighting this other family member? <laughs> that doesn't even fall into the equation. Juvia then had this water pipe thingo that she was able to give Grey a transfusion, Grey was able to survive, and Grey, in a massive fit of rage, absolutely obliterates Invel. Power scaling wise, Invel was really strong, and in fact should have been more powerful than Grey. But power scaling does not matter at this point in time. The obstacle to overcome, as I've mentioned, isn't a growth in power, it's the growth in bonds of your friends. It's becoming more and more entrenched in this beautiful 
beautiful family of fairy tales. The powerful moment isn't taking down the bad guy that's threatening to destroy the universe. The powerful moment is Grey and Juvia immediately, simultaneously, attempting to end their own lives so they don't lay a hand on one another. That's the high impact moment. Right after this takes place, we're back with Makarov. Makarov is facing an army of uh, like 14 trillion dudes or whatever, and even though everyone in his guild is fighting and being slowly overpowered, Makarov decides it's time to use Fairy Law. Fairy Law is this ridiculously broken technique that you basically convert your life energy into this massive spell that takes out anyone you deem as an enemy. That is, until you run out of life energy and die. There are too many opponents for him to just use some life energy on, and if he uses Fairy Law, he knows that this is the end of the road for him. Yes, the choreography is not great, but no, that doesn't matter. He uses Fairy Law and sacrifices his life to take down a massive amount of enemy troops. He doesn't want to chance his children getting overrun by these foes. For him, this was the only option. The scene then changes, because Natsu and Grey are in a feud because of whatever plot reasons require. And as Natsu and Grey both attack each other with an extremely ridiculously broken attack, Urza jumps in the way and with her bare hands blocks both Natsu and Grey, freezing one of her hands and burning her other hands to nearly ash. Power scaling wise, it makes no sense that Urza was able to block those attacks. Urza should have been obliterated with no armor, no magic, just standing in between these ridiculously broken forbidden magic attacks. But it doesn't matter. She blocks them and she's crying and she snaps the hell out of whatever ridiculous garbage was going through Natsu and Grey's mind at that time. That moment is so powerful. Power scaling wise, granted, absolutely trash. The emotions evoking from the audience at this time, absolutely next level. Our master Makarov just gave his life to protect his children and here you two are fighting it out with one another? That is a punch to the soul. And that is what a high impact moment in fairy tale is. That is how the protagonist of fairy tale, the guild of fairy tale, evolves. That is why the fights in fairy tale have meaning too. It's not all about overcoming your opponent in strength or in ideology. In fairy tale, the protagonist is not an individual. The protagonist is the guild itself. So now that I've talked about villains and now that I've talked about fight scenes, it's time to dedicate an entire segment to the grand magic games. My favorite arc in fairy tale, and I have spoken to so many people who hate it to its entirety. When I think amazing anime tournament arcs, the Grand Magic Games is in the forefront of my mind. There is no doubt that I absolutely love this arc. Not my favorite tournament arc ever, but definitely one of the best. So now immediately, here is some complaints about the Grand Magic Games. It's just a damn sports tournament. It's not like there's this massive plot twist within the tournament itself, like in the shooting exams, where it was secretly a massive terrorist attack against the Leaf Village. It's not this game that even has a threat of death, like the Dark Tournament in Yu Yu Hakusho. It's just just like, I don't know, festival where, where guys are having fun for absolutely no purpose at all. Yada yada, some complaints about the power scaling, choreography, whatever, we already talked about that stuff. But here's why you're all wrong about the Grand Magic Games. It encapsulates the core of fairy tale very damn well. Right after a seven year time, who's in the bob, the reputation of the fairy tale guild is in absolute shambles. All the strongest members just disappear for seven years and somehow manage to come back. The Grand Magic Games is this yearly tournament that all the guilds participate in and they get ranked and they get street cred and they get respect for how well they participate in this tournament. Not to mention they get money. But more on that another time. Now after these seven long years and now that the reputation of the fairy tale guild is an absolute shambles, our greatest wizards finally return time to participate in their first grand magic games. Or perhaps the reputation of fairy tale can come back. Over these seven years that they were gone though, a lot has changed. Sabretooth is the new top guild in town and they have literally everything as a one-up on fairy tale. Their main squad has someone that uses dimension magic, which is kind of like an upgrade to Urza's dimension magic, where she just summons weapons. They have this dude who uses memory make magic. He can create anything out of just memory, which is a upgrade over Grey's ice make magic, where he creates things out of ice. They have two third generation dragon slayers, which are an upgrade to Natsu and Gajil both being dragon slayers. And they have a lightning god slayer, which is an upgrade to Loxus being a lightning dragon. Dragon Slayer. They are a new and improved 
high-tech, high-functioning fairy tale guild that is wiping the floor with the competition. They are flexing so hard on everyone, and fairy tale's reputation is down in the dumps. Now, what have we learned so far? The protagonist of fairy tale is fairy tale. We, the viewers, don't just relate to the protagonist. We feel like we are a part of the fairy tale. Guild. Our guild and our family was berated for seven years. We traveled along with the members that got the seven-year time skip, not with the ones that were insulted. We come back to our guild with a tarnished reputation, and we are going to be there when the guild comes back full force. So, the Grand Magic Games is a tournament where in the beginning you're not exactly sure what's gonna go on, but it results in a massive flex-off where Fairy Tail absolutely flexes on the competition in the most badass way possible, while simultaneously saving the kingdom from a massive dragon attack. Not the point. If I wanted to go into detail about every amazing moment of the Grand Magic Games, this video would be way more than double the length. But the purpose of Fairy Tail is not to vanquish the big massive foes. It's not to become the greatest Hokage of all the ill. Fairy Tail is about us, the viewers. It is about all of our individual stories where we are free to dream alongside the members of our family. And that family was put through so much crap over the last seven years. We are going to be enjoying every instant of it reclaiming its glory. Urza will fight a hundred monsters because she can. Mavis will come back from the dead to let Kana use fairy glitter because she can. Natsu is gonna ditch his teammate Gajil to take on the twin dragons alone because he can. Fairy Tail is gonna get two of their squads into the top eight, not just one elite one, because they can. Loxus is gonna obliterate the entire Raven Tail guild because he can. Natsu's gonna attack the Sabretooth guild leader alone because he can. The Grand Magic Games is absolutely amazing. It is quintessential and perfect for Fairy Tail's narrative. It is exactly what Fairy Tail is trying to do. It's not lame because they're not fighting some evil massive force that's trying to take over the universe because fairy tale is almost a slice of life first and a shonen battle manga second fairy tales tragic moments are amazing because we're crying watching what our family is going through when urza was fighting against tartaro's demon whammon who stole her sense of sight smell and sound and also increased her sensitivity to pain tremendously feeling the breeze against her skin was like feeling herself getting ripped to pieces by a flesh-eating bakaga Oh, damn it. But she was getting battered and tattered in this fight. The other people in the same room as her that weren't even the targets of these sensitivity spells could not move. Moving means more air touching your skin, meaning more pain and suffering. But Urza, with no senses, allowed herself to get beaten up so she could feel the pain of where her opponent's attacks are coming from and annihilate them. Through suffering, our guilds will progress. Caring about their friends and putting their family before themselves will make us cry. Gray and Ju via double suiciding, Makarov sacrificing himself for his children, Natsu standing up to fight an impossible battle as Urza lay broken and defeated. We feel with the emotional highs and lows of our guild. We cry alongside them and we will laugh. We will laugh hard alongside them as they flex on everyone that tormented them for seven years. The Grand Magic Games is the uplifting heart and soul of Fairy Tail. The people that hate Fairy Tail will hate the Grand Magic Games the most because it has the least quote unquote themes, plot, or tragic drama. So if you hate Fairy Tail, you hate the Grand Magic Games. But if you love Fairy Tail, then nothing beats these moments where our guild stands triumphant. I dedicated an entire segment of this video to the Grand Magic games because I feel like it encapsulates the heart of fairy. I feel like I've expressed why I appreciate how the villains are created, why I appreciate the themes present in the fight scenes, and why those themes are fantastic whether they're tragic or whether they're massive flexes. I've covered the individuality of the guild members as the support cast and the protagonist which is the fairy tale guild itself. That is all of the basic structures that make up a shonen anime. They all follow this one very core, very carnal theme. A theme that I think anyone that actually sticks through fairy tale can relate to to a tremendous degree. When starting fairy tale, I can understand why someone would not immediately fall in love with the series. I can see why it takes time to build an actual character friendship with the fairy tale guild members, just like building an actual friendship takes time. But after that friendship is built, you can look back. You can say, damn, 
Those times in the beginning were amazing. That's why Loki on rewatch Fairy Tale is actually even better than it is the first time around. That is at least the beginning. I do like the surprise flexes and the surprise tragic moments once I already love the guild in the latter half of the series. But now I only have two things left that I really would like to cover before coming to a final conclusion in this video. Now that I think I've elaborated where all the pieces fall in regard to the individual characters and their interactions, I would like to talk about the setting. A lot of people complain about fairy tales, very mundane world building. And to that, I have to say, I agree. While I feel like a member of the fairy tale guild, I know nothing past the walls of the guild. Yes, seems like a kind of nice country. I've heard of this Alvarez empire thing out, but it's not a world I like to explore. And that's not even necessarily a bad thing. To fairy tales defense, the only thing we really need is the guild itself and the bonds the guilds make. And that is why a lot of people hate the final arc of fairy tale, but I kind of really like it. Aside from the high impact moments or whatever, it's all the bonds and all the friends that fairy tale made along the way that are coming together to help out our family. Remember that time where we hated Sabretooth and we grew past our differences by kicking their butts? Well, Sabretooth has a lot of debts to repay at this point and they pay in spades. I think one of my favorite moments in the entire arc was Ichia saving ass. Ichia, this random dude from the Blue Pegasus Guild that they befriended so long ago and his most ridiculous power set ever saves the day twice. He saves the Thunder Legion right in the beginning of the arc and this mad lad challenges Acnologia. World building is something I always find interesting because depending on the main focus of the story's themes, it needs to do something entirely different. One Piece develops this massive political brilliant world map and I don't think I've seen anything with better world building than One Piece. But that said, One Piece is about the adventure so much more than something like Fairy Tale. Fairy Tale is about our guild and our bonds with the guilds we've befriended and well got into squabbles with in the past. The world building in Fairy Tale is so much more focused on old bonds that we're carrying with us to this day and much less to the different ecosystems or political environments of different places. Naruto is so entrenched in history where the history and lore of every ninja tribe is so damn awesome, I want to know the history of every different village. My Hero Academia world building wise is only interesting because of how quirks affect society. So seeing the different social uprisings in different areas as well as different social issues that arise from quirks popping up is absolutely fascinating. I don't know anything about history and I don't know anything about different political ecosystems like Naruto or One Piece, but My Hero Academia works in its own regard of world building. And the same goes with Fairy Tale. Fairy Tale is not about the grandiose politics of One Piece. It's not about the rich history and lore behind every nation like Naruto, and it is not about the interesting society about how they maintain life in this new quirk infested environment. World building wise, Fairy Tale is about the bonds our family has made with the others around us. So from a world building and setting perspective, I think Fairy Tale cashes out. I think Fairy Tale's final arc actually does put its right foot forward, incorporating every bond we've made with anyone ever in this massive showdown, where Shelia sacrifices her powers to fight against Time God Whammon, where Crime Sorcier, well, doesn't really do much, but they try, goddammit, and the whole idea of Crime Sorcier is misfits that don't fit in anywhere that all have this interesting connection to Fairy Tale or Jalal that bring them together as this militant vigilante unit that is pretty badass in its own way. And again, it all comes back down to this familial aspect of how I feel like as a member of Fairy Tale, these bonds we forged with everyone over all of our different missions actually matter to me and to my guildmates. So now I've pretty much covered everything there is to talk about in regard to a generic shonen setup and why it matters and why it hits hard in Fairy Tale's regard. So as a grand finale, I would like to talk about my favorite character in Fairy Tale, Loxus. His story alone encapsulates everything that I would like to express to you from this story. So just by going through the various steps in his buildup, it very much solidifies what I'm trying to say. When I mentioned that I didn't talk about my favorite antagonist in Fairy Tale, it's because Loxus is my favorite antagonist in Fairy Tale. In the Thunder Palace arc, Loxus is introduced as this really annoying spoiled brat. This dude is the grandson of Makarov, the leader of Fairy Tale, and this guy wants no 
none of it. He wants to take over. He does not agree with the lax, annoying way his grandpa deals with the guild, especially because his grandfather kicked his father out of the guild for being a dumbass. But we'll get to that later. With a heavy heart, he challenges the entire fairy tale guild to a little challenge. He and his three members of his Thunder Legion will fight the entire fairy tale. If he can win, fairy tale belongs to him. If he can lose, well then, you can kill him. He's an extremely powerful antagonist because he's always someone that the different members of the guild have their own individual bonds with. So this member of our family has turned against us because of his father, a former member of our family. Again, thematically, he is torn between his father and his grandfather. He doesn't know where to stand, and in the end, he selects power and challenges the actual guild. So now, I'm not gonna go through the entire Thunder Palace arc because while I do enjoy it a lot, I'm gonna stick to Loxus's basic development just to try and get my point across. In the grand finale of the Thunder Palace arc, when he's up against, guess who? Natsu! What? No way! And he's at his wit's end. He thinks he's gonna lose. He unleashes Fairy Law. Fairy Law, as I've mentioned before, ridiculously broken attack. Anyone that you deem as an enemy is absolutely obliterated by this ridiculously broken forbidden technique. It's his last resort. He's about to lose, so he decides, heck it, I'm gonna win this one. When he uses Fairy Law, it does nothing. He does not deem any member in Fairy Tale as his enemy in this heart. So Fairy Law is ineffective entirely. This big bad exterior that Loxus was putting up all along in the end of the day was an exterior. He didn't fully believe the things he was doing. This counteracts the theme of fully embodying your own ideals that fairy tale stresses. He wasn't working out in fairy tale because he couldn't figure out which family he belonged to, and he could not fully embody what he believed in. This moment is mind-blowing. The ruthless Loxus loves his family despite everything he's been doing. And when he eventually is defeated, in this really tragic moment, his grandfather kicks him out of the guild like his father. But in that moment, where Loxus is actually evicted from the guild, that is when he becomes, in his heart, a member of Fairy Tale. That is when he realizes where his home is as he's kicked out. There was a sign that he always had with his grandfather when he was a kid, that no matter how crowded the streets are and he wouldn't be able to see him, if you raise your hand in the air in the fairy tale pose, which kind of looks like you're calling someone a loser, but let's not think about that for a moment. It means that wherever you are, whatever you're doing, I am there with you and I love you. Maybe it's cringy, I don't know, but in the massive festival at the end of the Thunder Palace arc, when Loxus is on his way out of the town that fairy tale is situated in, he turns back to take a look at the guild that he just obliterated and put through the ringer. And he sees every single member of the fairy tale guild with their hand outstretched into the sky in that pose saying, I am watching you, I care about you, and I love you, whatever you are and whatever you're doing. And Loxus, the absolute mad lad, Chad, savage beast, breaks down into tears. And when they're up against Hades, Several arcs later, the old second master of fairy tale, and he's about to defeat fairy tale because he is ridiculously broken as a final appearance in Pops Loxus. No longer a member of fairy tale in name, but a member of fairy tale in heart. And well, he inadvertently definitely does save the day. Well, directly at one point and inadvertently another in that very same arc. Loxus's character encapsulates exactly what I love in an antagonist for fairy tale. A complete counter to fairy tale's actual ideology. On the one hand, he loves them, but on the other hand, he can't. He also can't stay true to himself, which is all also something that fairy tale is very much averted to. Despite all of that though, when push comes to shove and the arc ends and he's kicked from the guild, he truly becomes a member of fairy tale in heart. Even though he's no longer a member of fairy tale in name, completely flipping that switch. He comes back of course because he truly loves the guild. In the Grand Magic Games, he takes down his father, severing his ties with his past that kept him away from his family. And in a complete show of selflessness in the Tartaros arc, when Bane particles are spreading throughout the entire city, Bane particles being this ridiculously poisonous demon spell thingo that kills anyone that breathes them in. Well, it doesn't exactly kill them, it just, yeah, you know, it's not so bad. It puts them in excruciating pain until they die out of pain. And Loxus, with his dragon slayer lungs, breathes in every bane particle that was meant to take down the entire city. And he is suffering through that pain, not willing to give up for the next several years until he eventually manages to expel them, whatever, blah, blah, blah. It is the ultimate character development, the ultimate back and forth, encapsulating every theme I love about Fairy Tale. That's why Loxus is my favorite character. This is why Fairy Tale is an amazing anime. It's not a bad anime that I hate. It's not a bad anime that I love. It's not a perfect anime by any means, but it's a great anime and I very much love it.
Everything I've said until this point is from an objective standpoint. Obviously, all art is subjective, and therefore you have full right to enjoy it if you like, and hate it if you don't like. But objectively, I'm trying to make a case for why Fairy Tale isn't only not as bad as people say, but actually good in many degrees that other shonen cannot reach. Now I want to talk about it on a slightly more personal level. Not necessarily personal as in, I was attacked by enemy ninja, so I threw a fairy tale Blu-ray DVD disc thingo at them, and it allowed me to escape. Fairy tale is forever my favorite anime. Not exactly what I mean by personal. I mean, this is a personal appreciation I have for fairy tale, and I think it affects many people in a very similar way, which is why its following is massive despite the bad backlash one receives from saying they like fairy tale. Stupid as that sounds. When I watched fairy tale, it was kind of the right place and the right time for me to experience this type of show. I myself at that point was very lost. I did not know who I was, I did not know what I was planning on doing, and I was kind of just going through the motions, wearing whatever mask I needed mentally to fit into any situation at all. I had no per se passion for anything and I didn't feel like I was accomplishing anything. Now I don't want to say it's thanks to fairy tale that I managed to overcome that challenge because, well, it's not. Fairy Tale just happened to be with me at that time, and being that I've been watching Fairy Tale for like a goddamn decade, I've been living with this series at every turning point of my life. At the point where I was not happy with myself and had to wear this metaphorical mask, all the way to where I am now. I know YouTubers complain about not being in a healthy mind state, but I am very grateful for the progress I've seen myself make over the last bunch of years. And just like the different characters in Fairy Tale, Tale are always acclimating with each other better and better where their bonds grow stronger and stronger as they learn to become more of who they are where they can follow their own dreams and they can have whatever quirky nature they want with no repercussions from the other members of their family that's been very similar to my experience as well if you've seen my channel you know I'm a relatively quirky dude I'm not the most uh, let's just say normal individual on the face of the universe the people that actually like fairy tale don't make videos defending fairy tale because it's like taboo almost <laughs> you cowards no Honestly, I don't blame you at all. I totally see it. For a coward, I'm putting my heart and soul into this fairy tale video because no one else on YouTube did. I know I'm gonna get crap for it, and honestly, I don't care. This is my perspective of something that means a hell of a lot to me. And it's not just me. There are many people that connect to fairy tale. There are many people that live in a society where they too have to wear a mask wherever they go. Where they too want to be free to dream. Where they too want to actually be themselves instead of try and emulate something they're not for the sake of those watching. Everyone judges. Everyone judges to the point that if you made a bad joke 10 years ago on Twitter, that tweet can be pulled up in front of you now and you could lose your job because of it. We live in an extremely judgmental world. Wearing masks became a habituated way to survive, and it is not healthy. But in this wonderful guild of fairy tale, a place where everyone's quirky natures are completely out and about, where anyone can dream, where anyone can become what they want to become, and they have people around them that care about them for who they are, not who they're trying to make believe they are. A guild that welcomes anyone as long as you have the right shaped heart and the ability to dream. The ideal of what fairy tale is and the beauty of this guild is so welcoming to so, so many people. People who never had to undergo mental ups and downs, I believe, are the majority of the people that don't like fairy tale. Fairy tale is for people who society would deem rejects if they would know who they truly are. And this is a safe haven for all of them. The fairy tale guild, the protagonist of the fairy tale anime, is one of the the few places that really feels like home. So with that said, and with Fairy Tale having just ended in the anime, thank you so much, so, so much for your many, many years of friendship. And it's not a friendship that's over either. It's on to new horizons for both Fairy Tale and for every single Fairy Tale fan and viewer. This video wasn't meant to discuss every positive theme or detail over the course of the Fairy Tale story. It was meant to tell you why I think Fairy Tale is great. So even though the Fairy Tale anime did end, and even though I'm approaching the end of my tribute to my happy year spent with fairy tale. It's on to new horizons with new adventures in an unknown future. But you gotta remember to embrace that quirky side of yourself. You have to remember to be yourself and not just live a masked life. It's important to have dreams and it's important to try and reach them. Because no matter where you are or what you're doing, we will always be members of fairy tale. Remember to like and subscribe as well as show it to any of your fairy tale fan slash hater friends to see what they think about it. But most importantly of all, remember to stay weird, fam. <laughs>